uh, education session, discussion of right repair. I'm Mark Heron, president of Total Truck Parts and legislative affairs manager, director, or whatever for CBSN. Our goal today is to update you on all things happening with respect to right repair and any potentially threatening issues that could affect the service business and other parts business. We are fortunate to have two great panelists to update and answer your questions uh, at, at the end of the presentation. I ask that you listen closely because everything that is happening with respect to right repair will affect everyone's business. Not just the parts business, but the service business and even the supplier side of the business. So let me introduce our panelists. Uh, our first panelist is Linda Fauché. Thank you, I'm sorry, Lisa Fauché. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Introduce yourself. Michelle. Sure, I'm Lisa Fauché. I'm the Senior Vice President of Government Affairs and the General Counsel for the Auto Care Association. Um, this is my first HDAW show. I'm so excited to be here. I started with Auto Care in September of last year. Um, prior to that, I was an attorney at AT&T and I uh, worked on our Internet of Things group. So I was responsible for the business unit that sold all of the connectivity to the connected cars. And so it's really exciting for me to be here and, and learn about this industry and meet all of you. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Lisa. Our second panelist is Ann Wilson. Well, good morning, everybody, and um, I'd like to join uh, both Mark and Lisa and thank you for being here this morning. Uh, many of you have seen me over the years at this gathering, and I'm so glad to see so many familiar faces. I've been with NEMA for uh, 18 years. Uh, before that, I represented the tire industry, and I did start my career off in Washington, D.C. at the American Trucking Association, so I may be one of the few lobbyists who don't work for ETA who's ever been inside a truck. So uh, I don't know. I mean, don't put that on my resume, but we can talk about that offline. Uh, it's really exciting to be here with Lisa and with Auto Care. We're working a lot together on this issue, and I think we have a lot to update you with and a lot of conversations that we need to have on this important issue. Thank you, Ann. Thank you for joining us. Now the first question, right to repair, may be a new topic for some in our audience. But um, let, me, let, me, uh, let me get to something first. I want everybody to understand what is involved with right to repair. Right to repair is about the conveyance of information from the vehicle to the scanner. And it passes through a, um, a port, a data port. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later. So I'm a little bit out of sync here. But anyway, I wanted to ask the first question. Maybe a topic for some in our audience, or it may be a topic uh, that is familiar to you. But uh, you may not believe it impacts your business. I, I know, having been involved in this many years, that, that is the case. Part of people tend to not think this may affect them that much. But why is this an issue so critical to the entire aftermarket? I'm going to ask that to both Lisa and Nate. Well, I'll jump in first. And I just want to repeat what I said on Monday, and if you heard me. Passage of a federal legislation on repair access is the number one priority of NEMA aftermarket this, this next two years, so 23 and 24. We feel like there's a couple of reasons why it's timely. As we all know, the vehicle, all vehicles, are transforming. We are looking at zero emission vehicles, which are getting more complicated. We are looking at automated technology, which Lisa mentioned. And it is getting more and more difficult to both supply and dependent parts and to service vehicles, whether it's a consumer vehicle, you know, a bike vehicle, or it's a tractor trailer. We feel like the time to do this is now. There's a lot of interest up on Capitol Hill on repair access overall, whether it's your computer, your refrigerator, all of those things where you've got to bring um, the manufacturer back in to replace the motherboard. How many times do all of us have to do that with our things in our house? But as Congress has looked at this, they also understand that motor vehicles are part of this conversation and have to be part of the solution. I would also add that we have learned anything over the last three years is the fragility of our supply chain and the importance of domestic logistics. So we need to be telling our elected representatives repair access is important for commercial vehicles, for heavy trucks 
because we need to keep every truck that's available out there on the road. It's about the economy. It's about getting bread to grocery stores. It's about getting those shipments of raw materials to manufacture these things. All of those things are important. And truckers cannot afford to have their trucks delayed two days, two weeks, or something else where they look for a part. And that's why I think it's so important for all of you to be involved in this debate. Yeah, just to build on what Mark and Ann said, right to repair is a term that is becoming not only a catchphrase, but a movement. And we're seeing it in all different industries. We're seeing it in the consumer electronics industry. We're seeing it in agriculture, which we'll talk about in a minute. We're seeing it in automotive. We're seeing it in heavy duty. And it is critical, as Ann said, that we continue to carry the message that while this may not be an issue for you today or tomorrow or the next day, five years from now, this is going to fundamentally affect our industry. And so we have got to care for it today. And I think the beauty of Right to Repair is how well it fits in with the theme of our show here this week, shift, adapt, grow. The trucks are shifting, they're becoming uh, electric vehicles, they're becoming computers on wheels, they're becoming software driven, and we have got to adapt to the new ways that we're going to be able to get the data off those trucks to be able to repair them, maintain them, uh, engage in predictive maintenance. And so we therefore have to have this issue taken care of so that you and your businesses can continue to grow into the future. So I think when you think of shift, adapt, grow, you can think of right to repair and why it's so important that we further this, this issue with our legislators. Thank you. So understanding how data moves from the vehicle to the scanners, uh, why is telematics an issue that's so important to heavy duty cap? Well, the way I think of it in the most um, direct example as to why telematics is a shift for which we have to adapt, is if you think about your first laptop when you wanted to connect to the internet, you had to connect with an HDMI cable into the, into the port in your house, and you got that data, you got access to the internet over that cable. Now, you turn on your laptop and it connects wirelessly, and that's how you access the internet. Trucks are exactly the same, and that will be the truck of the future, particularly um, as we move into the electric vehicles. And so if that access is blocked in any way because the data is being transmitted wirelessly, you are not going to be able to get the information that you need to repair the vehicles, to diagnose the vehicles, to create parts for the vehicles. And so we have got to make sure that that path that's known as telematics is made accessible to the entire industry. Um, one of the other things that you really have to care for in that transmission path is where the data goes. Can you access the data directly from the vehicle or does the data go to a separate OEM server controlled by the OEM and you then are given access to only portions of that data as determined by the OEM? We believe that you need access to all of the repair data, all of the repair codes, all of the diagnostic information to make your business, your parts, your repair shops as effective as possible and to best serve your fleet customers. And so we want to keep that transmission path, that direct access to the data available to our industry. And that's why the telematics issue, and you hear that term, is so important and so linked to the right to repair effort. So, so the current MOU does not cover the transference of telematic information, is that correct? That's correct, Mark, and that's one of the big, um, the big reasons why we can't, in our opinion, continue to rely on that MOU that's in place for the commercial vehicle industry. Thank you. And does the recent MOU with John Deere have any impact on our situation? And if so, what are the differences between this and our MOU? Well, I think there's a couple of things. One is, I think it's very important to sort of level set the conversation. It's always important when two parties come together and try to talk and solve a problem. So both the Farm Bureau and John Deere are to be congratulated for doing that, even if the path that they got there might have been a little difficult. 
But the second thing is that looking at it from our perspective, and if you look at the MOU that we're operating with, that um, AutoCare and others have such a big role in, again, it does not address telematics. Neither does John Deere. The enforceability is really very questionable, so how, how would they actually be able to enforce it? The Farm Bureau and the farmers who agree not to seek legislation of the whole deal is null and void. And you know, as we look at these issues and the developing technologies, and as we sit here today, we know we're going to be talking about different kinds of technologies in 10 years. To put a thing, to put a line in the sand and to say there could be no growth for that, we find that problematic. And one of the things that I think auto care and Nemo want to make sure that you understand is while we applaud the efforts of the MOU with John Deere, we believe very strongly that federal legislation is what is necessary. Now, you know, all of you are business people. And, you know, you talk about Congress, you talk about, you know, seeking legislation, and you're probably thinking, oh my gosh, just I don't really care. You know, I don't want to go to Washington, and I don't want to talk about it. But there are times where the federal government jumping into a conversation Jumping into a debate between parties is absolutely necessary to protect your rights, as Lisa outlined. So there is other limited ways that we can do this, but the problem is time is not on our side, folks. As the vehicles continue to change, and as we talk about repair access for other technologies, we need to make sure that our concerns are addressed in a way that it can be appropriate for the here and now and appropriate for five or 10 years from now. And that's what we're trying to do with the federal legislation. Great. Yeah. Go on. Yeah, I totally, um, totally agree, Anne, and I think it's very important um, for you all to understand very clearly that the, the MOU with John Deere had, it's with one OEM, and either party can walk away from that OEM on 30 days, I mean, from that MOU on 30 days notice. So it has a termination for convenience, essentially, um, which as you all know from your business contracts, is not a great long way to build a long-term relationship. Um, and then thirdly, they, as Mark alluded to, it doesn't cover telematics. And so there has been some positive feedback about the MOU social media um, about the ability to reach an agreement and again as Ann said certainly collaboration is always your first choice but our experiences for our industry it has not been successful for the future it's been successful up to now it will not be successful in the future and so we unfortunately don't think that that is the path that we should take collectively right an MOU, just so everybody understands, it's an agreement that doesn't necessarily have enforcement. So you can agree to do something, but if somebody doesn't do it, and there's no enforcement tool in the MOU to make them do it, it the MOU can be relatively worthless, and that's one of the problems that's, that's out there. Um, so let, let's talk about the telematics a little more about the state, uh, uh, things that are happening at the state. So there's a lot of activity that mo many of you have read about, about state activity, particularly in Massachusetts, Maine, uh, and, and other states. Can, um, Lisa, can you update us on what's happening with all of that state effort? Absolutely. Um, just a little bit of background for those of you that may not be familiar with, there are two state efforts ongoing right now. The first is in Massachusetts, and the second is in Maine. In Massachusetts, um, we introduced a uh, ballot initiative that was passed overwhelmingly by the, um, by the voters in Massachusetts. I think it was 75% of the people voted in favor of it. So it preserved right to repair for both automotive and commercial vehicles. After that passed, the automotive OEMs, um, the Fords and GMs of the world, um, sued the Attorney General in Massachusetts to block implementation of the ballot initiative. There was a trial held in the summer of 2021, and since that time, the judge's decision has been delayed six, seven, maybe eight times now. Um, every time the judge indicates that he 
might rule he decides that he needs additional information or allows an additional hearing or has additional discovery, um, all of which is perfectly within his right to do, but it, it has taken um, a very long time uh, for the will of the voters in Massachusetts to be implemented. As of now, there is additional discovery ongoing in the case that is scheduled to wrap up in February of this year. And we remain hopeful that once that discovery is completed, the judge will issue a decision. I think the reality is that whatever the judge's decision turns out to be, the losing side will appeal it in the appellate courts. And so while the, while the um, law will be able to go into effect, I think we can anticipate that it will be involved in some sort of um, litigation for the next two years. Um, but ideally, if we can get it out of the trial court and we can get it implemented and get things moving, that would be a great step forward for all of us. Okay, the other side of this is the federal level. Oh, let me, sorry, Mark, with Maine, too. I don't want to forget Maine. Maine's where we need your help. So we, um, have, we are running a second ballot initiative in Maine, and we collected the requisite number of signatures to have it put on the ballot in 2023, which is very exciting. Those, ballot, those signatures are being validated by the Secretary of State's office right now. If um, it's determined that we have the right number of signatures and they're all valid, it will be put on the ballot and we'll then take it to the voters in Maine to um, you know, see if we can get their support for this initiative. And that is something, and Anne will talk about this more also on the federal level, but this is something where we really could use your direct help. If you have operations in Maine, if you do business in Maine, if you have employees in Maine, um, please reach out to us because your involvement and your boots on the ground support for that initiative will be invaluable in getting the support that we need. Thank you. Very good. Now on the federal side, we're going to hear from Ann on what's going on in the next steps. Well, in the last Congress, which was 2021 and 2022, we had a really important piece of legislation introduced, the Repair Act. And it is um, what was legislation that created um, a mechanism to consider the kinds of telematics, which other kind of repair and maintenance is necessary for the freedom of choice for all consumers. And as I mentioned before, it does include um, commercial vehicles. So it does include heavy trucks. Uh, we believe that this is the Congress to get this done. So let me level set this, because some of you were in here on Monday when I talked about the problems of Congress and getting things done. But there are members of Congress who want to be able to deliver to their constituents, their voters, you know, actions, legislation, completed programs that are important to them. And repair of commercial, you know, of your vehicles, repair and maintenance of your vehicles, repair and maintenance of other electronic components in your, in your um, house and in your business is actually one of the initiatives that we believe has picked up a lot of support. We had two hearings on the issues last fall. We know that we will be reintroducing a piece of legislation um, later on this month at the beginning of February. And this is really, really important because you can introduce a piece of legislation but what we need to do is make it a must-pass piece of legislation. So let's build on what Lisa was talking about, the support of each and every one of you. Each of you have rented facilities. One of the things that I was really impressed with yesterday when we did the distributor award is how many smaller communities and large communities our distributors, our suppliers, our repair network is in throughout the country. We need you to work with us to have your elected members of Congress to your facilities. And trust me, you're sitting there thinking, oh no, 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 no. I'm not having those folks in my facilities. They won't come. They will come. Because think about it. Your employees are their voters, are their constituents. And what you want to do is, you wanna, we used to call it, you want to have a first date with them. You're not going to necessarily plan a wedding. What you want to do is have a second date. But what you want is to 
educate those folks on why repair access is so important to your business, to your customers, to your suppliers, and as I mentioned before, generally to the economy. We can help you with that. AutoCare can help you with that. At the end of this, we're going to put up a, um, a website that you need to go to to sign up so you can be part of this grassroots network. We can have other people in your community in the repair network who can actually visit with you. You want an hour of their time? Tell them why this is important. Introduce them to what you're doing. Talk to them about your business, business growth. And give them, a, you know, we'll give you talking points. But give them a, a real understanding of why this issue is so important. And just for those of you who are not going to be able to stay to the end, www.repairact.com. Go into it, sign up, be one of our grassroots leaders, and we can help you make sure that we get this legislation.